My name is Sebastian Lay. I'm MBL's Chief Advancement Officer. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items just to get started. Please turn your cell phones off or silence them. There may be consequences. I won't tell you what. Um, the, the talk this evening is being uh, simulcast and recorded, so uh, just so you know that. Uh, there will be time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, those will come from both in the auditorium. Please wait for the microphone because they'll also come from online. We do have a substantial online audience this evening, so uh, hopefully we'll have a mix of questions at the end. Um, and uh, I do want to just thank uh, both the MBL communications and events team, uh, as well as the Falmouth Forum Committee uh, from the Friends of the MBL for putting together this season and putting on all of these events. Uh, they do a lot of work behind the scenes to make these happen. Uh, they raise some of the money for the endowments that make these possible. Um, and it's a mix, as you know, of, of science and culture and history and literature, et cetera. So uh, we're excited for the season, we're excited for tonight, um, but I do wanna just uh, sort of make a plug for some wins that the MBL had in the last week. Uh, we had some members of our community recognized from two very prestigious prizes. Uh, last week, um, uh, two members of our community won the Breakthrough Prize for Basic Life Sciences Research, um, Tony Hyman and Cliff Brangwin. Uh, and one of our trustees, uh, Tim Springer, uh, won the Lasker Award uh, just uh, yesterday. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, I will turn it over to one of our Falmouth Forum members, uh, committee members, uh, to make the introduction, uh, Ambassador Daymel. Thanks very much, welcome. I hope you all either got one of these cards or will get one when you leave. It has our full schedule. We'd be excited to see you all for each one of these events. The goal of Thelma Forum is to create friends for the MBL by having a series of free lectures. Of course, there are some costs and uh, it does help to build an endowment which we're working on, so any contributions to that were very much appreciated. Tonight we're actually building friends for two of the world-class scientific organizations that we have here in Woods Hole, the Marine Biological Laboratory and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It's true that they have very disparate missions in many ways but they can and do collaborate together to benefit all of us. With a terrible destruction of an event that's aided and abetted by climate change, Hurricane Ian, very foremost in our minds, we appreciate having scientists Loretta Robeson and Scott Lindell here tonight with a fascinating and hopeful message. Loretta and Scott are experienced professionals and they have very impressive CVs which are available online so I won't try to reproduce them here. For those of us who are, are a little older, they, they look very young, but trust me, they're not just beginners, they've been at this for a long time, they're very experienced professionals. And their message is not just a concept, it's Department of Energy funded, and well along in development, so we're looking, really looking forward to this. I'm not sure that one of the first things we all thought about when we began to struggle with finding solutions for climate change was seaweed. At least it wasn't for me. But we can be glad that it was for Scott and Loretta. Can seaweeds be sustainably farmed for food, feed, and fuel? Loretta and Scott will present their answers. Please hold your questions until the end, and let's welcome Loretta Roberson and Scott Lindell. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. 
Well, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to talk about something that I think we're both passionate about, seaweeds. <laughs> Um, so, um, my name is Loretta Robertson. I'm an associate scientist here at the Marine Biological Lab Laboratory. And Scott Lindell is a research associate at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And we're going to talk to you today about the promise of seaweed. And, you know, let's not forget that seaweed form the basis of some of the most productive and diverse ecosystems on the planet. Like you see here, this giant kelp forest. And the idea is, can we harness that productivity to help us face the many problems that we are facing today? And, you know, as um, Day had alluded to um, with the hurricanes, you know, the last few weeks have really brought home the, you know, the idea that our greatest uh, challenge that we face is climate change. And so, how can we help? prevent climate change while at the same time providing food to a growing uh, planet population, you know, projected to be um, at least 10 billion in 2050, and without destroying the, the planet in the process. So Scott, can you maybe take us through a little background to how we get there? Yes, let, let me set the context here for the, the global challenge that we face and one of the likely solutions. We can start this animation. Um, can I do that from here? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, in order to feed the extra 3 billion mouths that we're anticipating we'll need to feed by mid-century, if we were to employ agribusiness as usual, we would need to discover and develop the land, equivalent, land space equivalent to an entire continental U.S. That started yet? Um, it should be. Oh it gosh, work. I'm so sorry. It's going haywire here. Losing a little bit of a drama here. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, but there it is. Imagine that we'd have. It's like trying to discover Atlantis, right? But we'd have to develop that much land for agriculture to feed three billion mouths. The alternative, though, is right there in 70% of the planet in the oceans. If we were to aquaculture or marine farm, that much area, coastal New England states and New York state, and spread out around the globe, we would meet the same protein and calorie needs that we face now in a much, much lower carbon footprint kind of way, saving a lot of land, a lot of wildlife, a lot of diversity. So to put this into sort of historical context, you might say, well, why don't we just go out and fish more? You know, seafood is good for us. It's low, low, uh, uh, low carbon. Well, historically, if you look at the last 50 years, fisheries have been flatlined. We aren't going to get any more productivity out of the oceans naturally. Um, so since the mid-70s, aquaculture has been slowly climbing worldwide mostly not here in the developed world in the US, but it's gotten to the point in the last five years where we are collectively as a global population eating, getting more seafood from aquaculture, from farm sources, both fish and shellfish and seaweeds, than from the natural fisheries. And that's gonna to continue to climb if we're gonna uh, uh, meet our needs, both as a middle, growing middle class and a growing population around the world. What's good news about seafood in general is it's much lower resource intensive. If you compare the, uh, the sort of traditional proteins that we're familiar with, poultry, pork, and beef, they're very highly intensive in terms of land use, water use, feed, and greenhouse gas emissions. Salmon, shellfish, seaweeds, these are all much lower, pro much lower uh, resource intensive. And sugar kelp, seaweeds, as one example, sugar kelp is probably this, the climate champion of them all. It actually can help sequester carbon as, as well as uh, be very low in all these other resource intensive uses. No fresh water, no fertilizer required. So let's put the global production of seaweed into perspective here. It has basically doubled in the last 10 years 
mostly in Southeast Asia, where they consume a lot of seaweeds too. And it's not a small business. It's $15 billion in value currently. If we look at the distribution of what kind of seaweeds are being grown, about half of them are kelps or brown seaweeds. These are projects that I'm leading, and I'll tell you more about later. And then there's the red seaweeds that produce a lot of carrageenans and, in, and food industrial products, or food processing products. Those are projects that Loretta leads here from the MBL. This is a, a good heat map to get a sense of where is seaweed farming happening around the globe. And you can see it's right centered in, this, in here between China and Indonesia and the countries in between. Japan, Korea, uh, Philippines, they're all big contributors. 98% of the seaweed is coming from this regions of the world. And the irony is that they don't have some of the biggest EEZs, this exclusive economic zones for developing offshore or nearshore even seaweed aquaculture. France, United States, Australia, Russia, United Kingdom, top five. It's just a rounding error on all the other seaweed being produced. There's a huge opportunity that's being missed here, right in our own country. So this opportunity is slowly being recognized. Um, this, this total production over the last five years between Maine, Alaska, and Norway amounts to about a, a million tons. It's, it's, a, it's a tiny proportion of the world production. But you can see in the last five years, these are annual uh, production numbers from 2018. It's slowly climbing in Maine, Alaska, Norway. Um, and there, this, this, is, this may be slowed, unfortunately, by some other trends. Time it takes, sorry, the time it takes to get a new farm permit is also climbing uh, to the point where it's taking six or seven years in California to get a permit to grow food or seaweed in the ocean. Um, this is one of the things that may stand in the way, but we also need to think about the markets. Sorry. Um, so these, these four quadrants here sort of talk about what are the, the more traditional markets for seaweed currently. Let's start in the far bottom right quadrant here. This is as old as Mother Nature itself. Ecosystem services is what kelp and kelp beds and kelp forests have been doing for a long, long time, providing diverse habitat, uh, cycling carbon and nitrogen so that it becomes part of the food web and uh, stabilizes our, our climate. Um, wave attenuation. Kelp beds in California are very good at breaking storm surges as they come through. This may, at some point, as, sea, as farms grow, become something else that seaweed farmers can monetize. There are already carbon credits, already nutrient trading for nitrogen. Let's make that part of this whole equation so that seaweed farmers get credit they deserve. Animal health, and, and uh, uh, this is, again, something that's pretty old in, in farming with livestock, particularly organic farming now. They all require some kind of nutrients and, and minerals, and, and uh, uh, kelp and seaweeds are especially rich, concentrated uh, amendments, feed amendments. Um, it's not the pure, it's not the most of their diet, but it's an it's important component to that. And then human food. We're all familiar with sushi and, and uh, seaweed salad, um, uh, but it, it also becomes part of uh, some of the Seaweeds, particularly that Loretta has been leading with red seaweeds, become food uh, processing ingredients that are important for binding or gelling. And then the last one, which I think is uh, probably where we're going to see the biggest growth, if we can get the cost of seaweed down, is uh, the energy and industrial products. Creating things like alginates, where there's whole books <laughs> written on. But alginates, for instance, are very important for wound healing and burn um, healing in, in uh, applications in, in medical science. And we're all familiar with the, the classic petri dish that's filled with agar derived from seaweed. Micro microbial science would not be the same without agar and the like. 
So those are sort of the traditional and uh, more long-standing uses for seaweeds. And Loretta's going to be talking a little bit about the innovative uses. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, actually, this evening, someone asked me about what kind of products do we make with our seaweed. We don't actually make them, but we partner with some of these companies that are doing some innovations for the US market to get um, people used to eating seaweed. As Scott mentioned, it's already been um, part of the diet in Asia for many, many years. Um, but here, uh, we do have seaweed salad and seasonings, but there's also companies that are making really tasty hot sauces and kelp pickles and a kelp burger. And then one of my favorites, and uh, has a great name too, is the chicharrones. So they're sort of made to mimic the pork crackling chicharrones, but made with with kelp, so wonderful. Being creative. Uh, there's also been a lot of development with um, entirely new products made with seaweeds that not only help reduce the carbon footprint of making that product, but are also biodegradable or compostable. So for example, AlgineNet, they're making a thread made from seaweed that um, is uh, compostable. And then there are several other companies making shoes or um, sort of plastic packaging, either for you know, wrapping up clothes or you know, sh what we get shipped in from Amazon um, to single-use packets, like for ketchup or uh, et cetera. So there's a, a lot of innovation in this space and, and trying to build that market uh, with seaweed that is good for so many different uses. So. A lot of good reasons to be optimistic and hopeful about seaweeds, and it's really captured the public and press imagination. As you can see here, you know, seaweed is now being touted as the solution to climate change. Well, it's likely to be part of the solution, um, and there's always wonderful pieces of truth in all these articles, but sometimes the hope gets overrun by hype, and Laura is going to talk about some of the, the science that's still to be developed. Yeah, so this, this media attention caused a little bit of concern in the scientific community because this, this hype is kind of moving ahead of the science. Yes, there is promise seaweed can do things like fix carbon. That's what they do in photosynthesis. Um, you can remove nitrogen, et cetera. But there's still a lot of things that we don't know about about how carbon is cycled, how nutrients are cycled, and how farms might impact the environment, especially at the scales we're talking about. So as a, as a way to visualize this, just a couple of, of examples of the scale of seaweed operations currently in Asia. And these are a couple of you know, common um, eaten foods, nori, kombu. And these are farms that can be seen from space. Okay, so it's, we're talking very big, but that's the scale that we're going to need to grow at in, um, in offshore sites where we haven't grown seaweed before. We don't know, even for these, we really don't know what the impact is going to be on the environment, if there's enough carrying capacity to support both the seaweed, these massive seaweed farms, as well as you know, the phytoplankton or other you know, ecosystems that are present in that, in that space. So there have been a number of major seaweed initiatives funded mainly by nonprofits, the industry, and governments. And I've just listed a few here. You might have heard of, say, Running Tide, that they are proposing to sink, grow seaweed and then sink it to the deep depths to sequester it. Um, there's others that are looking at uh, like greener grazing to grow a very fragile type of red seaweed, uh, difficult to cultivate, but to grow it at scale because this seaweed can dramatically reduce methane production. It's used as food for, for beef cattle. And then there is the Mariner program. It's funded by the Department of Energy. And um, they want to develop seaweed as a biomass for um, uh, biofuel production. And uh, their target is to um, bring down the cost of that seaweed production. And so what this figure is telling you is just the, the cost of production there on the left and all the 
the different countries that are growing seaweed at present and the cost of that production. And you can see we're nowhere near the target of $80 per dry metric ton that is needed to be competitive with other types of fuels that are currently in use. And so uh, this uh, DOE Mariner program, the goal is to um, really try to use seaweed farming as a climate change solution. And so they do that by improving water quality and, of course, um, removing CO2 from the water, removing nitrogen, potentially reducing sedimentation. Um, they can also produce valuable bioproducts. And we talked about some food, pharmaceuticals, textiles, but also biofuel. And then potentially reconnect habitats and, and restore the environment. Um, and all this without using any land, fresh water, or fertilizer. And Scott and I were, um, we've been funded by this Mariner program to tackle some of these issues. And we're also part of this ancient Mariner um, program. And that's the Alaska Northeast Caribbean Initiative for Energy Technology. And, um, and I'll just say here, ancient does not reflect in any way <laughs> the, the age of any members of this group. <laughs> uh, but it covers the, the areas that we um, do our work in. So my project, I work on tropical seaweeds that I lead here at the MDL. We have uh, another project we both work on together that's uh, based in the uh, Uni University of Alaska Fairbanks, also dealing with sugar kelp. And then Scott leads a selective breeding program uh, here at, at Hui. We'll talk about those really briefly. So um, my project, we have uh, a total of 15 institutions that are participating in this. And we look at every aspect of the seaweed farming. And this is because for, for my project in particular, we're growing seaweed in an area that hasn't traditionally grown seaweed, and that's in Caribbean uh, U.S. waters, and we're looking at species that haven't traditionally been cultivated. And so we need to understand the biology, the ecology, how they're impacting the environment, how the environment might be impacting the farm. So there's a lot of modeling. We have ground teams. There's outreach also to let people better understand what it is that, that we're doing. Uh, our, our main test site is in Puerto Rico in the southwest corner that recently um, had a Hurricane Fiona pass essentially right over uh, the top of our farm. Um, it fortunately survived. The island is, is struggling. but um, So it, it sort of just brings home the message that it's really imperative that we help develop this industry in that region and for small island states to uh, have a blue economy workforce and generate income for, for these areas. So as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at species that are not normally cultivated or haven't been um, commercially cultivated. So they're mostly red seaweeds, Helaminia, Eucuma, Brassillaria, that are important because of the, um, the compounds that they produce in a high percentage. So for example, Helaminia, Eucuma, they have a very high carrageenan content. Up to 40% of their biomass is carrageenan. And Brassillarias, are known for uh, agar. They have a very high agar content. But we're also trying some other species, like this green calerpa here. It's also known as a vegan caviar, and it's extremely tasty and very, very beautiful seaweed. Uh, in uh, Alaska, uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're growing sugar kelp there. And the, the idea for, for these cultivation teams is really to try to increase the scale that we grow um, seaweeds on a small footprint to bring the, the cost of that production down and increase the productivity per, per area. And so the farm is, is over twice the size of the farm that we have in Puerto Rico, 60 meters by 200 meters. And uh, we have these additional partners here, um, along with Hui and MDL, Green Wave, and Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation. And there, we've been able to demonstrate harvests of over 40,000 kilograms per hectare. And we can potentially double that by changing or decreasing the line spacing between the lines where we're growing. Um, and then just as a reference, that's 
63,000 63, kilograms per hectare is um, what is the current state of the art for corn production. Now the design that we are using to grow the seaweed is um, here, this catenary farm design. We think of it, it's essentially like a hammock in the water made up of multiple lines and the spacing um, can be changed or determined on what you know, species you're growing and the productivity. And here's some shots of some red seaweed growing on the lines and uh, sugar kelp growing. And as both Puerto Rico and Alaska have, have recently seen, there are a lot of storms in these areas. And so how do we mitigate damage from these? And so one innovation we have is the buoys that are at the four corners there are submersible. We can, if there's a storm coming, we can lower those down to the bottom while maintaining tension in the system to prevent any um, harmful interactions with uh, marine or other protected species aside from marine mammals. And then once conditions return to normal, we can raise that back up to the surface and continue growing. As we scale up, um, the, what we have envisioned is that each of these catenary farms becomes an individual module that can then be put together, and here this is a four by five array. And then these arrays can then be deployed in the environment in such a way that each array doesn't or has little impact on another array further, array further downstream from it. And if we look at um, the amount of area that's suitable for um, cultivation of seaweed in um, both uh, Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico and Southwest uh, US, um, I mean Southeast US, we see that there's over or uh, around 43 million hectares that is um, without many conflicts with other users that can be developed. That's, that's a lot of space right there in just those two areas alone. And then lastly, I should mention that uh, a key part of what we're doing is understanding not only the biology and how the seaweed are gonna respond to growing on these farm systems in open water, the open ocean, but again, their, their impact on the environment. So working with tools that have been developed by the, the Mariner program, as well as others at HUI, et cetera, we're using drones with special hyperspectral cameras that can help us in a snapshot see how much nitrogen, for example, that the seaweed is removing from the environment. Uh, we can use acoustic sensors to monitor how frequently uh, marine mammals are near the farm site or interacting with our farm site. And then, you know, really seeing what other species are there and then with water quality testing, really looking at how much carbon are they removing, how much nitrogen are they removing from the environment. And I'll hand it off to Scott so he can talk about his program. Okay, it's time for a natural history lesson. Many of you are interested in natural history or you probably wouldn't still be in this audience. Um, so across the top of this uh, figure here that's gonna describe the selective breeding process are the four different stage, life stages of, of kelp. Um, you're familiar with this blade that forms a kelp forest or a kelp bed. It produces spores, typically in the spring and the fall. Those spores fall to the seafloor bottom, usually under the kelp bed or the kelp forest, and those spores germinate into actually male and female individuals. They're multicellular, but they're microscopic. And nobody knows very much about what goes on there. They're very hard to study. They typically get eaten by something else before they spring back. And when the right temperature, light, very Manilow music, who knows, produces, <laughs> induces the female to produce eggs, and the male to produce sperm, they fuse, develop a juvenile sporophyte, and the cycle starts again. So that's sort of the, the sex life of wild kelp. I just told you all that we all know, which isn't very much. We have a lot more control over the sex life of farmed kelp, and that's what I'm going to reveal here. So we start with something we call automated spore sorting. Not very sexy, really, is it? But we take these spores and we can, we can sort them 
every cell into an individual 96 well plate. And so we now have unique genetics in each one of those little, little uh, wells, excuse me, thanks. Um, and they, de they will develop into the male or the female uh, individuals. We take the best and fast growest, fastest growing ones, put them in a flask, and then under certain conditions in the lab, under red light and certain temperatures, we can let them get them grow vegetatively. So we have a bunch of this biomass of this single genetic clone that we can then decide when we want to cross them, cross the ones from uh, northern Maine with southern Maine and see what we get. So the first couple of years of our breeding program have been pretty much potluck. Let's just cross whatever we can and see how it performs. Quick, for, quick fast forward here to um, we apply these juvenile sporophytes once they've developed onto what looks like kite string wrapped around a PVC pipe that gets mated to ropes that are in the ocean, suspended in the ocean about six feet from the surface, so they get just the right amount of light. Plant those in November, and we sit back and wait until May when you go from this tiny little microscopic blade to six to 10 foot blades. The other advantages of this kelp breeding cycle is that we don't have to go back and do this again. We can, we can maintain these gametophytes in this kind of stasis in the lab for decades. The other thing, this is not working. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Losing my punchline here. So when we grow up just 100 grams of gametophytes, a quarter pound of gametophytes, that can seed 10 kilometers of rope. And in six months, we can harvest 100,000 kilograms of kelp. That's remarkable to go from that small amount of biomass in six months to 100,000 kilograms. I think I've mentioned this, but we don't have to go back to the wild. With climate change, it's getting more and more difficult to time when we should collect these and get the spores. And we can't keep going back to those wild beds as the farm industry grows, or we're going to strip all the wild kelp. We need to protect that wild kelp, keep it doing what it's doing in the wild, and not go out and harvest it for, for seed. So I'm going to, there's a lot of steps that get to this yield graph. Um, I just barely touched on the, the planting process and all the engineering and biology that goes into that. But in the, for the point of brevity, I just want to point out this graph summarizes four years of very hard work. There, there, there are people in this room who, who are, uh, Maggie in particular, who's been uh, with me the whole time helping make this happen. So the, the uh, y-axis here, the number of crosses that, we, that fit into each of these bins of the, of the yield, the weight, from zero to 30, 30 kilograms per meter is what we've uh, measured. And over the last four years, we've been getting better and better at this with the selection, to the point where now we can, we've produced 18 crosses, pretty diverse, that are giving us more than twice what the commercial farmers are typically harvesting, 15 kilograms per meter, um, with the top cross actually four times as much. But we want to keep diversity going, so we're not going to just uh, advocate for one cross to take over the industry here. So what that means, this graph is, which is very busy, but it simply says the, cost, the, the, the current farm gate value for all the kelp sold last year in, in Maine was $600,000. Pretty small potatoes when you think of the, the lobster industry, which was worth 70-something million dollars. But with just adoption of these uh, selectively bred strains, they could, the farmers could double their income um, very simply. So that sort of concludes the, the, the project descriptions of, that Loretta and I have done, and, and it sort of brings us back to our fundamental question here. Can seaweeds be sustainably farmed for food, feed, and fuel? And I think you see all the promises of that. You see the the, the, uh, the path forward if we can implement uh, the breeding practices and the engineering practices and overcome the technological uh, and economic barriers for more wider adoption of seaweeds. And we're going to see that if we can also overcome many of the uncertainties around this. So there's still a good deal of science that needs to be done before 
seaweed takes over the way that corn farms have taken over Iowa. Um, we probably don't want to see that kind of intensity of development on, in the oceans. Uh, so we need to understand more about the climate and ecological effects of seaweed farming. What's the, what's, how does the C CO2 really uh, exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere? Uh, if sinking kelp as a climate solution is to become a reality, we need to know a lot more about the potential impacts on the seafloor bottom, what is the fate of that carbon actually once it hits there, and are there unintended consequences? Can't do this willy-nilly. And some companies are already jumping out ahead, I think, too fast without the science behind them. And Loretta touched upon this. Um, you know, there are other plant-like organisms, phytoplankton, that grow in the ocean. What happens if you do plant too much seaweed? Is it come at a loss for them? And what are the downstream effects? Um, so this, this, I think, just points to uh, we need to do a lot more science around farms and be able to modulate uh, their, their expansion um, with good science around them. And then the technological advances that we need to make, I, I've hit upon the, the, the most important one, that every techno-economic analysis says, if you can improve yields, they go right to the bottom line. So improving strain selections, reducing the capital and operating expenses. It's still very expensive to work on the ocean. Um, it takes a lot of time. And uh, there are only certain days you can get out there if the weather's not, not very good. So you need to have engineering and, and uh, boats that are suitable for all types of weather. And then this question of intensity of farming and impacts on phytoplankton, it all comes back to, are there enough nutrients where you site your farm? So site selection, um, one interesting idea that's been floated and actually been tried in principle, which is uh, there are nutrients deeper in the ocean that, than there are typically on the surface. Could the farm actually be physically lowered to the ocean, where the lowered in the ocean, where more nutrients are during the day when they're not photosynthesizing anyway, and absorb I nutrients, and then come <laughs> to the surface and enjoy the sun and grow? So interesting concept, but a lot of science that has to be done before we can really say that's practical. And you know, this graph sort of is the best example of how seaweed might mitigate climate change. And that is by replacing things that are more carbon intensive, things that have a higher footprint in terms of the carbon usage. Even land vegetables are more carbon intensive in, uh, in their production than, than seaweed. So if we can displace vegetables, if we can displace animal feeds, some proportion of it that's coming from soy or corn with seaweeds, create bioplastic packaging from seaweed rather than from petroleum, the bottom line is we can, we can uh, avoid about 11 million metric tons of CO2 a year, and we can save about 1.1 million hectares of land that would otherwise be used for those purposes. And also sequester another 4 million tons um, of met million metric tons of CO2 that comes from preserving that land as a carbon sink. And finally, um, we need to consider the social as well as the economic benefits of seaweed aquaculture. It's, uh, I borrowed this from a European report, but if you look at the EU, that's pretty similar in size and demographics as, as we are. They're pretty similar in, in coming along with this development of seaweeds. It's not a, it's not a invented here in the US idea. Um, so it could, by 2030, be generating another $10 billion market on top of the $15 billion world market right now, uh, creating over 100,000 jobs, revitalizing working waterfronts that are, that are fading because the fisheries are, are tapped out. And let's face it, seaweeds are really good for our health. We should be choosing them more often in our diets. They may never be center of the plate things, but a little bit of seaweed goes a long way because it's some of the most nutrient-dense food you can get in terms of vitamins and minerals and, and good antioxidants and the like. So we can improve our general health by eating more seaweed. All right, and so with that, we'll come to an end here and just briefly acknowledge our funding sources, the U.S. Department of Energy, RPE.
um, Mariner Program, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, with support from the Bezos Earth Fund, and um, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, and all these other partners here are critical in, in our work. And want to thank you, too, for being here and letting us talk about these amazing seaweeds, and we'll answer any questions you have. Is this on? Yeah. We knew, we knew you were going to ask the first question. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Scott beforehand to uh, give me a question to ask, so this isn't it, though. <laughs> I didn't give you any. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, so, uh, you know, I get the sense that there's a lot that's already known about the potential benefits of seaweed farming, but not as much about the potential consequences. And yet we have this imperative to really develop these kinds of products in order to combat climate change and so forth and so on. So where do you think we are in terms of uh, the science? Uh, like, can we really just roll this out in a big way at this point? Or do you think that uh, we're years away from understanding the potential downsides to mass uh, farming of seaweed? Like, where are we in this continuum of, like, uh, we, we can see the benefits, but we don't really understand the consequences? Well, we, we do understand, so fortunately for us, um, China has had very intensive seaweed farms, entire bays that would, you know, as big as Buzzard's Bay, there's, there are 90% seaweed farms. And they have done some pretty intensive ecological studies there. Um, the Chinese are doing this in rather intelligent ways because they're not just growing seaweeds in most of these water bodies. They're also growing shellfish. They're also growing finfish. It's something we might call now integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. So there are, there are ways of doing seaweed farming um, more intelligently, and we need to take those steps to do that. Let's, let's face it, any time there, there's too much of something, it can be too much of a good thing. We know that we can overdo it. And we've learned our lessons in agriculture, I hope, that we won't have to relearn them in, in the, uh, the ocean. Monocrops are probably going to be much more fragile or prone to pathogens or pests than if we intercrop things. So I think we just need to take all those lessons from organic agriculture and apply them to aquaculture. Yeah, I'll maybe just add there, too, briefly, that for especially the Mariner program, um, but the future of seaweed is going to be offshore. So we avoid some of those conflicts in the nearshore area, and that's particularly um, for development of industry in the U.S. And so there we have um, less potential of impacting other systems, but then more unknowns because we haven't grown seaweed in those types of environments. Will the you know that rougher wave environment be more um, prohibitive and not allow the seaweeds to grow? Do you have to worry about uh, predators that might eat up your algae? <laughs> yes, good question. Uh, they would be called herbivores, they're plant eating, right? Um, the people working on the farm would probably have to worry about predators in the op open ocean, because we do see, for example, in Puerto Rico, large barracudas, um, uh, sand tiger sharks coming around near the farm system. Um, but so far, at least in the Caribbean, and again, that's an, a benefit of being further offshore, because we, we're not close to reef environments or seagrass beds or mangroves where um, a lot of these herbivores are living. So um, we haven't encountered that yet, but we are keeping our eye on that. In Alaska, we'll see grazers, things that graze on the kelp. So snails will settle, and they become a, a, a nuisance for the processor, because they don't want snails and seaweed in their, in their goods. Hi. Um, since so much of this is about carbon sequestration and the metrics around it, I know you had a slide that had to do with some of the tools that you are using on the farm, but I was wondering kind of what 
tools you use or how you're able to measure the amount of CO2 that's being sequestered by each of your farms and if you know how accurate it is or how that technology is advancing? A great question. I would say we, we know exactly how much carbon is in the kelp because we weigh, we weigh everything and we do a carbon analysis of what it gets harvested. There's really only best guesses you can make as far as what's exuded into the water column, what might stay in the sediment for years, but it's not the carbon solution. I think it's not the carbon solution if you're going to just farm near shore and expect that the sediments are going to sequester anything in the century scale that we need them to. It might, might be for a decade, but it's not a long-term solution we need. One in the back, and then we have two right here. Um, as the planet continues to warm, um, there's going to be more acidification of the oceans. Has there been any work or any expectation of how that might affect seaweed farming going forward? That acidification? Yes. Yeah. So acidification is actually favors kelp farming. Sorry? I, I can't. I can't really hear you. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's talking about the change in pH levels, but it's right. in terms of photosynthesis in general, they um, like a more acidic environment. So as there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, there's more acidity in the ocean, and that in general favors photosynthesis. There there are some exceptions. There are seaweeds that have uh, or or produce calcium carbonate as part of their structure, and that um, favors more alkaline environments. And there have been studies on some species that it can affect their physiology and they don't grow as much or um, they can't photosynthesize as much. So that we still don't know that for all the different species that, that we're growing. But I think the bigger issue for seaweeds, especially um, cold water kelps, is actually the temperature. And Okay, I'm sorry, can you um, take the microphone? I did say acidification, but in terms of temperature rise of the ocean, does that negatively impact, go, you know, sort of the future of kelp? Uh, yeah, definitely, because like I said kelp like cold water, and but that's another reason why we also study tropical seaweeds. As the water warms, they can expand their dis distribution and be grown in, in more areas than, say, something like kelp could. So one part of my selective breeding program is to select for more temperature-tolerant kelp. Um, the kelp here in southern New England are sort of cut off from the kelp in the Gulf of Maine. As the Cape Cod sticks out here, we have two very different waters if you've ever swum in Maine versus south of Cape Cod here in the summertime especially. And those, those kelp strains in southern New England don't really have a way to escape north like our lobsters did. They can't move. So those populations are, are endangered. We've gene banked them all in our laboratory and with cooperators. Um, and someday we may be able to restore those if we ever get over this hump and start reducing ocean temperatures again. But meanwhile, we're using those to select for more heat tolerant kelp that will be able to adapt to climate change, we hope. Hello. Um... I'm trying to adjust my voice. <laughs> uh, I, I have two concerns, ecologically speaking. One is the, in selectively breeding for your more productive strains, is there a danger that those could effectively become invasive organisms and replace existing uh, algae and kelps and what have you in the environment where they're being raised? Uh, and thereby, you know, affect the balance of what the local herbivores and so forth. The other is, with all those ropes, is there a risk of marine mammal and reptile entanglements? Well, let me tackle the first one. So all, this, all the strains that we're developing, are these, there's no GMO involved here. We're simply taking what, what agriculture has done, and aquaculture, frankly, for decades and centuries. Um, selecting the best individuals that happen to perform well on, on a farm we typically plant them side by side so they have the same environmental, uh, and same competitive environment to, uh, to perform in. Uh, 
Um, so everything is taken from local habitats. It's not taken, we're not planting kelp from southern New England into Maine and vice versa. Um, so that's the first point. Um, on the uh, issue of entanglements, um, this, is a, this is one I've been at, I've been studying for some time now because I also uh, conduct a lot of research on mussel farming. Um, and an interesting sort of statistic is that uh, ropes in the water often get blamed appropriately for entangling whales. And the difference between fishing rope and aquaculture rope is pretty significant. And I think it's why, when I give you this statistic, you'll understand that the, the risks of entanglement in aquaculture structures are infinitesimally much smaller than fishing gear. So uh, I did a calculation of how much rope is in the water here in the Gulf of Maine at any one time, any one lobster season, for instance. And it's about enough to go around the globe seven times. And we get about 30 to 40 entanglements a year in fishing gear, mostly lobster line. If you look at mussel farming and seaweed farming that have been conducted over the last 40 years, each year, most recently, you could circle the globe 50 times with that, with that line instead of seven times. A lot more line in the water. Guess how many entanglements there have been in mussel and seaweed lines in the last 30 years? I can count them on one hand. Half of them were released, and sadly, two or three died. But that's the magnitude of the difference we're seeing in the risk from aquaculture versus the risk from fishing gear. And it's tragic when any marine mammal dies. But we, all types of food production we conduct have risks and impacts, and sadly, we have to live with those. Go for one question online, and then we'll come back into the audience. How would large-scale seaweed farming interact with shipping and fishing industry interests? Are these potential opponents to seaweed development? I can take, I take it. Uh, okay, sure. I can. <laughs> well, um, we've been very lucky in this Marino program to be engaged with NOAA's Coastal Ocean Science Program. They've developed a map that they call the Aqua Mapper that is an important tool for both regulators who are going to approve any farm. You can't just put a farm out pretty nilly-willy in the ocean. There's a huge, long public process, sometimes extending seven or eight years, as I showed. Um, and that, that Aqua Mapper tells you what kind of conflicts you can expect and where, to, where you can put your farm and not expect conflict with shipping, with fishing, with recreation, with power lines. And you, know, you name your, there's 50 different layers in this uh, database. So we have the tools to do this intelligently. And I might just add there too that the, the engineering design of our systems too is made such that we have less of a surface um, presence and they're deep enough that at least most recreational vessels can drive right over the top of the farm without any problem. A tanker is not going to be able to go over it, but we wouldn't put a farm in a, in a shipping lane like that. Um, thank, you, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. Um, my question is about Cape Cod. Uh, down here, many of us know that there's uh, severe problems with uh, nitrogen in the water fertilizers and so forth. Uh, what, if anything, or I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this question, but can, can this farming help to ameliorate this, this problem? Or maybe the other way around is the, you know, can, can this be the, the solution to some of these issues here on Cape Cod? Um, there, there have been attempts, my, myself included, to put a farm in Wakoit Bay some years ago with uh, Sea Grant funding. We were growing grassalaria, a, a summertime crop. Um, and uh, we produced some wonderful grassalaria, sold it into, showed we could sell it into New York City at 
$16 a pound. This was 10 years ago or more now. Um, so it's yes, it's definitely possible to do that. Cost effectively is another thing. Um, uh, I, I, <laughs> the labor that went into put doing that, it, it's very, very hand, uh, handy work intensive. Um, my conclusion at the end of that report was that you could harvest wild grass larry because it's rolling around there like tumbleweed in the bottom of Okoit Bay. Um, usually only for, for a few short weeks a year because otherwise it becomes fouled with everything else that's, that you wouldn't want to eat. Um, but there is a market for that and you could actually remove nitrogen as you did that. Uh, whether you could make a business out of that, whether, you know, whether there's some regulation and food safety issues you'd have to uh, overcome too, that need, remains to be researched. I'll, I'll say one more thing and that is that Long Island Sound um, has been the study site for potentially growing kelp for nitrogen credits. And uh, that may be, a, there they have a huge problem too, much like we do here on Cape Cod. Uh, and that may, there may be a future day when, when farms get nitrogen credits for removing nitrogen in their farming process. Yeah, I'll add really quickly a brief um, example too. In Australia, to protect the barrier reef, they're deploying seaweed farms near the mouth of rivers to do just that, remove that excess nitrogen. What do you envision are the major stumbling blocks to prevent us moving ahead in the direction that you're proposing? You've mentioned a few, but I suspect there are others that we yeah. have to deal with. I don't with. think it's technology. <laughs> it's mostly social. It's, it's getting the social license to operate in the public realm. It's just very, very difficult. It's very, very slow. Um, and it's risky for an investor to put up a lot of money only to have the regulators or the stakeholders uh, shoot it down. Um, so anything we can do to uh, stream streamline better stakeholder engagement early on in this process to uh, zone, if you will, create aquaculture zones for, uh, for development because we know they're not going to be in somebody's way not going to impact protected species, et cetera. Um, that's my recommendation that we come together realizing this is a great social solution, it's a great economic solution, and we need to get all the stakeholders, be they, be they fishermen and wind farm, influ, you know, wind farm, wind farm uh, stakeholders, et cetera, uh, all users of the ocean, and, and come up with a plan to make aquaculture part of that instead of the, the poor step cousin that's come along lately. <laughs> and I think too, the markets are really important. Um, we talked about all these great new products that are being made, but they're all startup companies. They're not making these things at scale or in the scale that would be needed to make a, a change in that carbon footprint. Has anyone um, tried doing land-based open system flow through uh, aquaculture with the kelp so that you're not in conflict with the space and the boats and the those issues? Yeah, there there's a very small uh, operation in California, Monterey, Monterey Bay seaweeds, and um, they make beautiful uh, several species, both red and some kelp species. But again, they're taking up valuable land. They're, they're not using much fresh water, but that's on the coastal areas where there's a lot of conflict with other uses. So that's not really a practical solution. I think we need to learn how to grow them in the ocean that you know, covers 70% of the planet. Uh, we'll take, let's take our last one from the audience. Um, so I was wondering why kelp is focused on so heavily. Is it considered a more convenient uh, seaweed to grow in terms of production? Um, and why there isn't a focus on other seaweeds, at least from my perspective? Well, well let's, first of all, let's be clear that there are dozens of species of kelp, right? Um, and, and brown seaweeds tend to be the most productive in terms of growth and yield. So the, the pound of effort you expend is 
is rewarded by many, many pounds back. Um, and you can do, you can control this life cycle. With the red seaweeds, for instance, that Loretta is focused on primarily, everything grows vegetatively. So you, it requires a lot more hand labor. This is why all the growth of this industry is in Indonesia and the Philippines, where the cost of labor is a lot less than trying to do it here in the Western world. That's one answer. Yeah, and, and you know, at least for here in New England and Alaska, the dominant species are kelp species. Um, but the, the red species, on the other hand, they have the benefit in that they grow for, for multiple seasons, not quite year-round, but almost year-round. And whereas kelp, you have, you know, maybe you can get two harvests, but most of the time it's one harvest per year. So they may not have the same high growth rates as kelp, but um, they grow for most of the year, but in other warmer areas. Well, unsurprisingly for an audience in Woods Hole on this topic, we have uh, less time <laughs> than we would like for all the questions that we have. Uh, but please thank our speakers tonight and join us again. <laughs>